Mexico, 1876. The entire nation was exhausted, following decades of violent social upheaval. The Mexicans had lost a devastating war in the 1840s to the United States and given up huge amounts of land to the Americans. They had been conquered by France and ruled by an Austrian emperor. By the time the French were overthrown, the country was in shambles. Transportation was terrible. Communications were in sad states of disrepair. The economy was in shambles because of all of the revolts and counter-revolts. Because of the civil wars, it was impossible for Mexico to attract foreign capital. Uh, agriculture uh, was in a terrible situation because of the lack of the use of modern agricultural techniques. It was a country that hardly had been touched by the technological advances of the 19th century. With the death of the immensely popular Indian leader Benito Juarez in 1872, a powerful general named Porfirio Diaz emerged as the most prominent politician in the country. Diaz, the hero of Cinco de Mayo, believed that guiding Mexico would require a strong hand. When Diaz came to power for the first time, he was very uh, concerned about the need to establish stability in Mexico. Uh, if you looked at the Mexican past, you saw that it was one of the most unstable nations in Latin America. He wanted to stabilize the country, and he believed that he would have to stabilize it through force. There were two prongs in his plan to stabilize Mexico by force. One was the Mexican army, which he modernized. A second prong of this attempt to stabilize the country by force was the institution of a national rural police force called the Rurales. The Rurales became Porfirio's private enforcers, his political strong arm. There are between four and 5,000 Rurales. Under President Diaz, they have gained practically limitless powers. Their reputation for fearlessness has a most chastening influence. Charles Flandreau. Diaz filled the jails and prisons with his political opponents. Some were simply shot on sight, killed while trying to escape, was the official notice. Diaz's policy to control the peasants was simply pan o palo, bread or the stick. Yet many of his supporters were richly rewarded. Diaz ran the country like a crime boss, appointing local warlords who enjoyed a lucrative monopoly on liquor, gambling and prostitution. It was during the Porfiriato that border towns like Nogales, Juarez and Tijuana gained reputations as dens of sin, crime and corruption. Juarez city is a sad sight. People and shapes resembling people crowded the streets. The hellish music of the automatic pianos went on incessantly. Everything smelled of mud and whiskey. Up and down the streets, rubbing against us walked cheap prostitutes, ugly and unhappy. The racketed noise of the gambling machines came from the saloons and taverns. Martin Luis Guzman. By the late 19th century and early 20th century, you started really having emerging the border towns between the United States and Mexico, Juarez and Nogales and Tijuana. And these became sordid cesspools, um, um, centers where Mexicans would try to flock into the United States, where gambling, drugs, prostitution held reign. They were kind of lawless centers. The disparity of wealth between the United States and Mexico is seen in such a dramatic fashion in those border towns. But foreign money came into Mexico for more than tequila, girls, and gambling. By the early 1900s, American investors like the Guggenheims and Hearsts, lured by liberal concessions and cheap labor, began pouring money into the impoverished nation. American investments quickly grew to over a billion dollars, commanding more capital than the Mexicans themselves owned. Porfirio Diaz was the first Mexican head of state to enjoy a favorable reputation abroad, both in Europe and the United States. And the reason that he was favorably uh, considered was that he did stabilize his country, he did modernize his country, and did invite in foreign capital and protected that foreign capital. 
Diaz was willing to do almost anything to establish closer ties to American and European investors. Some believe he even tried to lighten the color of his skin to appear more European. Diaz, who looks uh, uh, initially very, very Indian and very dark, later on becomes much whiter looking and in his portraits. And um, they claim or they, they speculate that perhaps he was actually using makeup during the end of his uh, time in office to make himself look whiter and more acceptable to Europeans. Billions of dollars in foreign money opened new mines, built new factories and railroads, and pushed Mexico into the industrial age. It was generally not Mexicans who benefited most from economic growth, but American giants, such as U.S. Steel, who controlled 75% of Mexican mines. When oil was found along the Gulf Coast, it was American and British companies who flocked to the region building huge refineries. Trainloads of iron and coal went north across the Rio Grande to feed the furnaces of America's Industrial Revolution. Diaz was not able to change everything, but he made remarkable strides. He was responsible for having the Mexican railroads constructed, for the installation of telephone and telegraph systems, for the institution of streetcars in the, in the uh, larger cities. He was able to dredge Mexican harbors and thereby provide access to large ships, opening Mexico up to the outside world, really, in, in a new kind of way. And uh, uh, the Mexico of 1910 was a far different place than the Mexico of 1877. Though Mexico seemed to be booming, the huge profits went only to a few. Diaz and his supporters amassed incredible fortunes but for most Mexicans, life remained a daily struggle. The disparity between rich and poor was made worse by the regime's land policy. Diaz sold off public lands to investors at a fraction of their worth. When the public land was gone, the big plantation owners, the Hacendados, even went after the tiny pieces of property owned by the peasants, land that had been won at great cost people had been given land in the northern tier as a reward for fighting the um, uh, indigenous peoples who were very warlike in those areas, particularly the Apache. Uh, so they had been given land and honor. And then to have their children then forced off their land caused a great deal of resentment uh, and a great deal of anger. By 1910, 800 wealthy hacendados owned 90% of the rural land. 96 million acres, one-fifth of the entire country, was owned by only 17 people. Four people owned 30 million acres in Mexico's lower California. One man owned 20 million acres in northern Mexico. In sharp contrast, the peasants were offered nothing but debt and backbreaking labor. As one foreign observer noted, the village belongs to the hacienda. They're all obliged to work in truly feudal style. In busy seasons, children and even old men are pressed into service. Ethel B. Tweedy. The situation of rural workers was terrible. It actually was getting worse and worse and worse during the Porfiriato. And much of the economic advance was made on the back of what I can only call exploitation of Mexican rural workers. The employment of kids that were eight or nine years old, 12 hours a day or longer in various da very dangerous working conditions. Um, and this was necessary in terms of just family survival. They needed for the children to work because the wages were so low. Porfirio Diaz justified the oppression by quoting his cadre of elite intellectual advisors, the Cientificos, who espoused the then popular European theory of social Darwinism. The Mexican must be ruled from above because he is not fit for democracy, must be enslaved for the sake of progress, since he would do nothing for himself or the world were he not compelled through fear of the whip. John Kenneth Turner. 
The intellectual circle around Diaz looked ever to Europe for elite social theories and aesthetic taste. Mexico City was remodeled along European lines with grand boulevards flanked by ornate public buildings, most designed by foreign architects. Even the townhouses and hacienda villas took on European fashion and manners. Beneath the veneer of the wealthy, however, the peasant unrest was seething, and three unlikely and very different men would lead a revolution of incredible proportion and bloodshed. A poor horse trader from the south, a notorious bandit from the north, and an idealistic landowner. <laughs> 